So if, if the neurons are self-organizing, A, how do they know that they're self-organizing and how do they know where to go and be organized? That's a very good question. And, you know, I mean, self-organization is, is a remarkable force of nature and biology, right? And very often when we do these experiments in a dish, to be honest, for a very long time, I was sort of like thinking like an engineer in the sense that, oh, if you want to build something in a dish, let's say a circuit, you know, you better so sort of like know the blueprint. You better know like the instructions and provide them at the right time. And so you don't start building a new house until you really have a very clear plan and the tools. But what we realize with time is that in biology, actually, you know, cells come with the instructions, you know, so once you make a specific cell, cell actually comes with the instruction. And then by connecting, let's say to another cell, it reveals another set of instructions right? and another one and another one. And that's what we call this process self-organization. So which really is the formation of order structured from, you know, relatively homogeneous elements, which, which, by the way, like talking of physics and chemistry, this was known from the 19th century. I mean, there are classic experiments that show, you know, that molecules organize quite beautifully. You know, the rylet bernard convection, I guess, is the classic example. But biology just brings it to the next level and now organizes cells pretty much on their own. So what you're doing is you're bringing these together in this culture, this 3D culture, where the message and directions are already resident inside of the cell. So when you put them together or group them, they basically do what they were going to do anyway. Exactly. Okay. With, with, uh, with one detail, which is we have to make the parts right. Uh -huh. If you don't have the right parts, then of course they won't know what to do. What to do. Actually, what we spend a lot of time generally is making the parts. And let's think about the human brain. I mean, the reason why the human brain is remarkable is because it has all these parts, which are very different. You know, unlike, let's say, the liver. The liver is relatively homogenous, right? A few cell types, kind of like any part is like any other. Mm -hmm. You look at the brain, and now you have thousands of cell types. I mean, the recent estimates, you know, say that there are probably 2,000 cell types just in the human brain, right? Scattered through all these nuclei and regions. And the remarkable abilities of the brain really result from the cells interacting with each other. So in the early days, like, you know, 15 years ago, we were making just a few cells, like a few spinal cord neuron cells, or maybe a few cortical neurons. But then we've never really leveraged the ability of the cells to connect with each other. And so that's where essentially assembloids came, where once we figure out how to make some of the cell types, some of these brain regions, putting them together, essentially, you know, was unleashing like new forces of self-organization, which is really what the brain does. I mean, the brain builds itself at the end of the day, you know, if you think about it, right? And, and, and it reorganizes itself. Like if you damage a part of your brain, it will reorganize itself so that that function might be taken up someplace else. At least early in development, yes. Early in development, it will do so. And then the more you progress, the, 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 you know, the, the less you the can less do that. The less that happens, right. What mm -hmm. if you leave exactly. your cultured brain cells in the dish for nine months, a year? What yeah. happens to them then? Do they just take care of business on their own or do they just fade away? Something crawls out of the Petri yeah. dish. There you go. <laughs> you have the smartest dish in the world. <laughs> It'll chase you down the corridor. <laughs> Get that fork away from me. But that was something actually, you know, really fascinating that we discovered like, you know, almost 10 years ago. So at one point we were, you know, my lab was still like in the early days. And at one point, you know, we realized that, well, I mean, it's an expensive experiment. You have to keep feeding the cells. And I was running out of money in the lab. And so I told everybody in the lab, I said, you better go in your incubators and like make sure that you're not maintaining cu cultures that we don't need. We need to focus. We need to save money. And then somebody in the lab comes and says, oh, should I also like remove the ones that are like 300 days old? <laughs> I was like, what do you mean like 300 days old? It's like, yeah, I mean, you know, we, you know I, I knew that we were keeping them for very long periods of time, but I had no idea that we could keep them for such a long period of time. And it turns out that once you make this cluster of cells and, you know, sort of like, I wish I could show you, I wish you were here in the lab and I could show you, or maybe I can try, but they look something like this. All right. I see it. These we are, see it. They're not a lot. They're still like fixed, you see. So they're like relatively large clumps of cells. They're floating in the media, in the incubators. You keep going and change media. And then at one point we realized we can keep them for very long periods of time. In fact, we maintain now the longest cultures that have ever been reported. Like you can keep them for years. And so now the question was, are they stuck in development? Are they progressing in development? Uh. 
And through a series of papers, we discover something really fascinating. It's like they actually keep track of time really well. So well that once they actually arrive at about nine months of keeping them in a dish, they actually transition in terms of their gene expression and some of the properties of the cells to a postnatal brain. So it's almost like they know that birth should happen. Wow. There's almost, and so like, we think that there is some sort of internal clock that keeps track of time. Is this the brain clock that I've read about? Yeah, this is the brain clock, exactly. I'm fascinated now that these cells have the ability to understand basically a calendar. I mean, because they're not, they're not observing the, the sun tr- going across the sky a day and a night. Y- yeah, so what's, what's, what's doing the ticking? What's the, yeah, exactly. The, yeah. So, I mean, you may think that this is, you know, surprising, but if you think about it, it's not that surprising. I mean, every time you make a human, you always make it in like 280 days. And and here's the interesting thing. If you take mouse stem cells, okay, Mm -hmm. or we have like chimp stem cells, and you differentiate them the same way in a dish, they'll finish development in their own time. In the same, but in in that that same time period reflects the gestation period of a chimp? Mouse? Like it will be three weeks for the rat wow. and it will be like, uh, you know, whatever is for. So this is, I mean, evolution has actually selected, yeah. you know, very well, like the spirits of development. And so they're intrinsic to the cells. I think what we, what was surprising for us was that this happens also outside of the, of the body, right? Like outside of the uterus. Of course, this is not to say that all aspects of development are recapitulated. I mean, there are all kinds of things that are coming, right? All kinds of information that are coming that are shaping development. And we know that the more you invest in human brain development, the more the environment is important, like sensory information, right? Like uh, cognitive development, think about motor behavior afterwards. But especially at early stages of development, everything is quite well regimented and goes according to a calendar. Nobody knows what the clock is. So nobody knows what the molecular mechanism of it is, but it is somewhere in the cell. It's something that is counting somehow time and well, that's why it's such a great time to do neuroscience. You know? <laughs> like more people should like come and, and do that. 